Hello, everybody. My name is Christian Palaguachi. I'm the director of civic engagement for Phi Eta Alpha. Joining me now is uh, Anna Miguel from Border Angels. They represent uh, the Western province of our NAI fundraiser for spring 2023. We'll be going over the things that Border Angels does for the community and all, all the good work that they do. So with that being said, Anna Miguel, could you please introduce yourself and you know what your role is in the organization and you know all the good stuff that you guys do? Yeah, so hello everybody. My name is Anna and I'm the Educational Programs Coordinator at Border Angels. So my position entails that I, you know, provide these interviews for students or organizations that reach out, as well as taking groups out to um, certain programs like our water drop program where we go out through the desert and visit um, heavily trafficked or typically commonly trafficked migrant paths. And in these water drops, we also provide life-saving supplies, whether that's the water gallons in themselves or other supplies like uh, canned goods, um, especially during the cold, we'll leave behind mylar blankets or heated uh, hand warmers, as well as beanies and other um, clothing during the during the winter months. And then during the summer, that's typically where we'll leave, you know, t-shirts, boots, um, backpacks, and other resources as well. We have other uh, programs that are all aimed to provide support to migrants and refugees, as well as asylum seekers who are entering the United States, whether that's you know from Mexico or other uh, Latin American countries or other uh, countries in, the, in um, the world as well. Um, like I mentioned, um, our work is really aimed to support the communities that have entered the US or who are facing hardships in Tijuana. Since we are based in San Diego, uh, we are really, really close to the Mexico and U.S. border, and because of that, we see the reality of what immigration looks like here and how that continues to impact um, the communities that are in San Diego as well. Well, yeah, it sounds like you guys do some really good work and, you know, you put yourself out there in, in, into the into the areas where it's most effective. So can you speak to a little bit more about, you know, the idea of how did Border Angels come about, you know, where where did it start and, you know, how did you guys get to the level where you guys are right now? Yeah, so the Border Angels was started in 1986 by Enrique Morones. It was initially set up to help migrants living in the canyons of Northern New York County. And then since then, we have been able to expand and conduct humanitarian work for migrants along the entire U.S.-Mexico border region. Um, so now we also serve the San Diego County immigration population through various outreach programs that I am happy to share about today. Awesome. So, you know, with that being said, uh, it seems like you guys have a good amount of history, a good amount of years uh, going back to your inception. Uh, so I know you spoke at Spell earlier, but can you kind of elaborate on the impact that Border Angels has in the community, you know, especially because, you know, we're a Latin Hispanic based organization. So how, how does that aid into those communities? Yeah, so our office is actually located in a community center. It's located in the Sherman Heights Community Center. And being in a community center, I feel like it has definitely been beneficial as it invites the community that's local here to stop by and learn about the work that we do. And it's also just a very um, good space where that's easily accessible. Uh, we have you know public transportation here in San Diego. We have the bus, the bus uh, stop that's really close by. We also have the trolley that's really close by and makes our office very accessible to anybody that might have any questions, whether it's related to somebody that they know or just the questions that they may have about the programs that we are able to provide. Uh, we often have volunteers stop by to drop off donations for programs that are close to their hearts. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we actually had a volunteer who uh, donated some waters for our day labor outreach program, as well as for our water drop program, since there were programs that were really uh, close to her and she had history with those programs as well. Um, and then, you know, just another example about the programs that we provide and how they impact our communities. Like I just mentioned, our day labor outreach program. Within this program, uh, we're able to support day laborers. Day laborers are uh, people who often, you may see them outside of like Home Depots and Lowe's, those type of construction stores. Um, and these day, day laborers typically work in work that's related to construction or landscaping um, type, type of work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the day laborers typically congregate around these these store sites, uh, waiting to get picked up for work that day. Um, a lot of them have shared that they might that they 
face discrimination, whether that's through the employees at those stores or the customers at the stores who will go out and harass them, unfortunately. Um, we've also had them share that sometimes they may have some problems with law enforcement, whether that's border patrol or the police that's there as well, uh, that might just be, you know, patrolling the area. And because of that, we want to make sure that these laborers know that they do um, have somebody that's advocating for them or that's that's recognizing that, you know, that they're there. Um, and the way that we're able to provide support to them is either providing a lunch to them, whether, you know, that's just a small package of like fruits, um, some other, you know, nutritious snacks, or even providing our little Know Your Rights cards. And for these Know Your Rights cards, it's very important to provide that information to them because oftentimes they may not know that they have rights or they may not know what rights they do have. And some other issues that laborers have um, spoken about is that they may uh, be discriminated against by also the people that are picking them up for work. And an issue that they face with that is that those people that are employing them will either not pay them for the work that they do that day, or um, if they were to get hurt on the job, they don't provide the resources for them to you know, seek that help. And that's why those Know Your Rights courts are so important for them to know that they do have rights, even if, you know, let's say they are undocumented or they, or they do have the proper documentation. That's something that we never ask, but it's something that we always want to let them know that it doesn't matter what uh, legal status they may have, they do have rights to protect them. And some other programs, you know, that also tie into how we support our community or how, you know, our work impacts the community is uh, the shelter aid program. This program, uh, we work with uh, some of the directors who have shelters in Tijuana. These shelters aren't um, our shelters, but they're shelters that we support there. And we currently support 16 shelters, including an LGBTQ space, a Muslim space, and a Haitian shelter as well. And through this program, Border Angels is, is able to provide funding to our shelter directors um, and that with that funding, they can either provide you know, for their rent or utilities or construction that's needed in the shelters or even groceries. And then some other uh, projects that we've been able to fund for the shelter aid program is medical attention and water stations, especially during COVID, um, an expansion on the shelter for COVID-19 isolation. And we've also been able to purchase washers for proper sanitation of clothing in the shelters, and as well as offering mental health workshops through our partner organization, Psicologos y Fronteras. Um, in Tijuana. And, you know, something that ties in with those with the shelter aid program is our caravan of love. Uh, through the caravan of love, uh, we're able to do a call out for volunteers who are able to either provide donations, and they're also able to, you know, help just provide their cars to be able to transport those donations to, Tijuana, to the Tijuana shelters that we visit. And, uh, the, you know, this program, the Caravan of Love, you know, was a service that was sought to aid um, migrant asylum seekers that arrived in Tijuana, especially um, as the big uh, caravan of Central Americans were arriving there. That's when we saw that they needed the most support. Um, so that's how the Caravan of Love came to be. Um, and then, you know, just something that's important to keep in mind, you know, the shelters are often made up of adults. Um, and also just families or children. So we want to be able to provide as many resources, whether that is the physical donations or even something small like, you know, toys. Again, it's something that we may have the resources to easily be able to purchase, but these kids may not, or the parents may not be able to have that. So the fact that we're able to, you know, do that with the support of our volunteers or people that, you know, support our organization, that's very, very important to us. And just, you know, to touch on a couple other programs um, that impact the community, one of them is our water drop program, which this one is typically our most well-known program. And during our water drops, volunteers are able to experience a glimpse of what the reality is that migrants face um, as they cross through the desert. Again, it is important to know that this isn't the whole experience of what a migrant may face, but it is just a small glimpse. And volunteers um, are able to provide, you know, um, life-saving supplies, like I mentioned, the water gallons, or whether that's food items that are uh, available for those that are traveling through the desert. Um, and, you know, this this program is very, very important as we've seen policies come up that have created um, a difficulty as to how migrants are crossing or have pushed them to face more dangerous paths. And one of those uh, policies, you know, was Operation Gatekeeper that occurred in 1994, came out to be in 1994. 
And during that policy, what we saw was an increase in militarization of the borders, especially the U.S.-Mexico border. And the way that that militarization was apparent was through the increase of border patrol agents on the field, as well as an increase of technology. Uh, the technology that, you know, an example of it that's commonly used is the infrared technology where you're able to detect um, uh, body temperature out in the deserts. And, you know, obviously uh, border patrol agents use that to be able to detect uh, any migrants that are traveling at night. Um, another thing that we've, you know, that was very apparent that came out of Operation Gatekeeper was uh, border walls being placed in, in areas where border walls never existed. So, you know, this, you know, has clearly um, forced migrants to be able to have to travel through more dangerous paths and more dangerous routes. Um, so, you know, it's it's been very difficult uh, for, for many migrants to be able to find a safe, you know, path to enter the U.S. And something that ties into that is our Volving Vacas program. And through that program, we're able to provide funding to low-income families with the help of their respective consulate uh, to be able to return the remains of, loved, of their loved ones who may have passed away, whether they uh, were crossing through the desert or through the oceans. And actually one of our last recipients back, I believe at the end of uh, November, early December, was a 22-year-old. That just you know brings to light how young these individuals may be who are making the journey to the U.S. Um, and you know how difficult that journey is as well. He was only 22 years old and he died of a heart attack. So that really brings to light as to how dangerous the desert in itself can be. Something that we always keep in mind whenever we do take groups out to to these water drops is that you know they have to have the proper um, uh, resources to you know make it. So that's whether it be having a good amount of water, having um, protein snacks or things like that, you know, to just get them through what is typically an eight hour day for the water drop. Uh, so it's important to also note that, you know, these migrants are traveling for what, what may be weeks or even longer. And they're only having what they're able to fit in their backpacks, you know, so I think that's very important to, to note that even if it's difficult for a volunteer to go out there for just a day, um, it's even more difficult for migrant that is making that journey. So yeah, that is that's just a couple of the programs that we have. Um, and again, I did want to touch on the fact that we do have programs that support um, people here in San Diego as well as some programs that support um, the other side of the border as well. That's fantastic. And I think uh, all those different ways that border angels uh, is their community kind of speaks to how in tune you guys are with the needs of your community and the needs of your surroundings. So kudos to your organization, to yourself for continuing doing all that hard work. Now here at Fayota Alpha, like uh, I work in the Department of Civic Engagement. So a big part of our responsibilities is making sure that, you know, we engage with the community and we aid them in philanthropic ways. And a part of that is also fundraising. And because we have chosen Border Angels to be our Western organization for our, our spring fundraiser, um, how can our donations aid all those programs, aid you guys, and just continue to making those good impacts on your communities? Yes, yeah, so I think I, I first want to know that, you know, Border Angels is a nonprofit, so we don't receive any government funding. We do um, get our funding through grants and people who support us, you know, whether that's our donors, Many times, many of our donors are compelled to donate one dollar a month or a thousand dollars a month. Uh, and then obviously, you know, just within having that relationship with our donors, it really helps us build a community of love because sometimes donors will donate to a specific program, you know, whatever program is closest to their heart or a program they may have a relationship to. You know, I just mentioned that a volunteer uh, has donated physical donations of water gallons and other um other type of uh, supplies, you know, whether it's water bottles, we've also had volunteers or schools actually fundraise for us as well, where they were able to provide uh, hygiene products for, for the shelter aid program. They were also able to fundraise for toys for the, for the kids at the, at the shelters. Um, we've also had people fundraise for, you know, canned goods or other items that we're able to take out to the desert or use for our daily labor outreach program. So just having that relationship with people who see the work that we do and see the uh, the reality or have that understanding of the work that we do has been very, very beneficial to, you know, continuing to build that community of love with our program and with our volunteers for the people that support us. 
Um, and then with physical donations, you know, when people are able to give that physical donation, they do um, get a sense of that they're helping directly or assisting directly with the individuals who that program is impacting. So we've been able to see that, you know, um, just that good feeling that volunteers get, it, it does lead them to to continuously support us, which, you know, again, is 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 something that we're really blessed with, that we have volunteers and donors who, again, don't just stop at just one point, but will continue supporting us, whether again, that's through donations or with even donating their time for the programs themselves. And then, uh, you know, through these physical donations, not only are people placed in the gown, but they're also spreading love. And when we spread our message and like fighting against hate, negative or hateful rhetoric, it really does make an impact to have, um, I guess, the people who are supporting us grow. And that's something that, you know, we we heavily rely on on volunteers to donate their time. And we also heavily uh, um, rely on people who are donors, whether, again, like I mentioned, that's a monetary donation or a physical donation. That's great. And, you know, it's good to see that there's different ways to donate to you guys, it's not just a monetary ways. You can volunteer your time, you can volunteer supplies and resources. And, you know, I, I just want to take this time to say a big shout out to our Western chapters, Alpha Epsilon and, and such, for bringing our organization such as Border Angels to our attention so we can, you know, showcase you guys to the, to the rest of the uh, organization. Um, with, you know, with that being said, how can uh, our members and uh, be able to find you guys online, uh, a website, social media, how can they guys get in touch with you if they want to, you know, uh, donate in other, other ways or volunteer themselves? Yeah, so a good way, you know, to just get connected with Border Angels is to visit our website at borderangels.org, borderangelsaltogether.org. And there we also have our social medias linked where they can also sign up, you know, or just give us a follow. Again, even just sharing a post uh, that they see on our social media goes a long way. It's a great way to create a conversation with somebody that they know and, you know, share a little bit about the programs that we offer or even just um, our mission in itself is, is also a good way. Uh, they can also sign up to our newsletter, which again is also is also linked in our website. Um, on our website, you're also able to find, again, learn a little bit about the programs, about the services that we offer, um, about how you can volunteer, um, how you can donate. And we also have merch, merch for uh, individuals to purchase. I'm actually wearing one of our uh, merch pieces right now. You can see here, our Familias Reunidas uh, program. So yeah, everything is linked on our website. That's really the best way to to get familiar with us and to learn more about us as well. There you go. That's the way you can get in contact with them, support them, buy some merch, get a t-shirt and a hat and all of that. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time, Anna. And thank you again for the hard work that you guys and uh, everybody at Border Angels does for your community. Yeah, thank you so much, Christian. I really appreciate you reaching out to us and, you know, um, letting us into your space and letting us share a little bit about Border Angels. Thank you.